Magic the Gathering Arena represents Wizards most visually ambitious and feature complete version of a virtual representation of its card game. PAX East, look, this place is packed! Perfectly fits together the classical side of Magic with the new age of fast, fluid play. And I get playing and playing and it's just really fun. I think this is one big move in the right direction. This is huge. I'm pumped. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your Mythic Invitational Champion, Andrea Mangucci! Not every digital card game has the benefit of being based on the first and most successful paper trading card game in history. On its release in late 2018, Magic the Gathering Arena came out swinging, and it's no small thanks to the 21 years of groundwork set by its predecessors. Many consider this the definitive version of digital magic available to play, and with good reason. But it has been a long and bumpy journey to get here. In 1991, math professor Richard Garfield met the then-CEO of Wizards of the Coast, Peter Atkinson. After pitching his board game Robo Rally, Atkinson turned him down, saying that the then-small company did not have the resources necessary to produce such a project, but liked his ideas regardless. Garfield returned when Atkinson mentioned that he was looking for a light, portable game that could be played between events at gaming conventions. He showed him Five Magics, a two-player card game that he designed nearly ten years prior. Well, ma Magic was the evolution of my love of creating and tinkering with games. So it was, it was really a natural thing for me to want to make a game where all the cards modified the rules and people could choose which they play with. Adkison immediately saw the potential in the trading card game genre, and two years later in 1993, Magic the Gathering was released. I'd say the first round goes to the ore. Magic the Gathering, beat your friends. The game was an immediate success, even to the point where Wizards of the Coast were reluctant to advertise the game to keep up with the increasing supply demand. The card game model was a breakout hit as well, spawning many games that followed the format and would become their own phenomenon. In April of 1997, nearly four years after the release, Magic's digital journey began with developer Microprose, most known for their early entries in the Civilization and XCOM franchises. The development of Magic's first computer game was unfortunately plagued with the fallout of recent bad business ventures. With many employees looking to leave the sinking ship to save the game, esteemed developer Sid Meier was assigned to the project. This would be the last title that he would work on for Microprose, as he went on to found his own studio for Axis Games shortly afterward. Today, Magic the Gathering the 1997 game is more commonly known by the name Chandelar, referring to the plane of Chandelar that the game takes place on. The story is that the plane of Chandelar's sources of mana were guarded by five great wizards, one for each color, white, blue, red, green, and black. The uber-fiend and planeswalker Arzakhan was sealed away long ago, and has now turned those five wizards against the land, and are now working to free him. You began the game with a small simple deck of 40 cards and a life total of 10. Over time, you develop your collection and deck by defeating other wizards. The anti-mechanic, a long since abandoned optional rule from the early years of magic, was put to great use here. Every game, before drawing cards, a random card from your deck was put aside. This was the anti. Whoever won the game would receive ownership of all anti-cards. While the anti-rule was abandoned in paper due to a mix of general dislike and possible gambling law violation, it served well as a gameplay component. In fact, all gameplay components of Chandelar worked very well together. Starting out with a small starter deck, battling, buying, and trading your way to a large collection mirrored the paper progression system well. This was all on top of a very robust digital implementation of Magic's fairly complicated rule set. The phases were clearly laid out, and the game even provided some shortcuts for mana payment. It doesn't look like much, but it's really good. Just playing Magic on a PC is a lot of fun, but the introduction of RPG elements makes this game something worthwhile. And this game is different every time you play, as the world map and dungeon layouts are randomly generated every time, giving it ridiculous replayability. At the time, this was everything that a Magic fan wanted. And with the good general reception that the game got, an expansion was released later that year including 92 new cards taken from the Antiquities Paper Expansion set. In the following year, in February, Microprose re-released the game under the title Duels of the Planeswalkers. This version increased the card pool further with 385 cards. Also included was a new mode titled Mana Link that allowed players to play against one another online, with limitations. On August 1999, Hasbro announced their plans to have Microprose release a gold edition of the game later that fall. However, this version of the game was never released, and Microprose ceased to exist at the beginning of 2001. 
In the heart of the omniverse of Dominia, deep within the nexus of all planes of power, the world of Dominaria exudes the greatest mana. Together, the magic of the five mana can harmonize mankind or become the most powerful destructive force capable of ripping apart the universe. Another title trying to tap into the growing success of Magic, Magic the Gathering Battle Mage released for the PlayStation at the start of 1997, a month following Chandelar's release. Developed by Acclaim Entertainment, most known for their Turok and early Mortal Kombat games, Battle Mage was a complete departure for Magic's card game formula. Turns was replaced with real time, as the game had you not only play your creatures and spells, but micromanage them afterwards. The extremely sharp learning curve, unaided by the disappointing manual, was compounded by the incredibly unfair enemy AI that executed its commands with pinpoint accuracy. While it was cool to finally see many iconic magic creatures and spells come to life in a however slightly unflattering top-down perspective, the overall gameplay was a disappointment to both magic and video game players alike. So it's all very well, you can summon monsters, but for the life of me I can't figure out how to control them, which pretty much sums up this game in a nutshell. I can't figure out how to do anything, despite having the manual at my disposal. And ultimately, Magic the Gathering Battle Mage fails at being a simulation of either Magic the Gathering or being a Battle Mage. Its release and legacy was mostly overshadowed by the success of Chandelar. Another forgotten release, an arcade version of Battle Mage was developed alongside named Magic the Gathering Armageddon. Even though it was a significant upgrade from the home console version with its improved graphics, better interface and more intuitive controls, this arcade cabinet was never put into full production. Acclaim's arcade division went out of business shortly after finishing the title, and reportedly it is possible that as few as four machines in total were ever made. Regardless of how much better it could have been than its brother, today Armageddon remains an incredibly rare collector's item and nothing more. Magic's digital journey in the new millennia continued with a Japanese exclusive title for the Sega Dreamcast in 2001, titled simply Magic the Gathering. Returning to a mirror of the paper experience, this single player title was more than anything a good example of how difficult it was to intuitively digitize the paper rule set. The amount of menus that had to be maneuvered to execute even the simplest of turns is comical by today's standards. Here is an example first turn in Magic the Gathering for the Dreamcast. And here is the same turn in Magic the Gathering Arena. Even though it was held back by its overwhelming interface and a lack of multiplayer, it was still a pretty faithful recreation of the card game. The fluff surrounding it like the card animations, light RPG elements, and dramatic voiceover made it one of the best looking digital magics that would be available for some time, and it was a much closer representation of the paper version. Meanwhile, the paper version, now 8 years into its lifespan, was a roaring success, and regardless of all the hits and misses that its digital variations had in its history prior, the demand for playing magic whenever you wanted without having to go to a game store or tournament was clear. One glaring problem with these last titles was that they became quickly outdated with the release of new cards, which could come out multiple times in a year. Leaping Lizard Software, a small-time developer with only a handful of games to their name, pitched their solution to this problem. A complete, full implementation of Paper Magic, multiplayer tournaments, and card trading, all on top of an ever-growing library of cards that would be updated over time in tandem with the paper releases. This game would opt out of a subscription-based service, which was the norm at the time, and instead charge players for virtual goods that could be tradable and thus retain value. The scale of the initial project was massive, even more than the promise of an ever-expanding game. However, Wizards was interested in what Leaping Lizard had to offer, and after a weekend of furious programming, the developers presented an online client. Even though it only had four cards implemented, this proof of concept was enough for the company, who were already considering a fully-fledged digital implementation beforehand. Magic the Gathering Online was developed and went into alpha testing in early 2001, with wide beta testing later in the year. 
Following its beta period at the beginning of 2002, a press release was distributed outlining the game's card redemption feature, a first of its kind. For a $5 fee plus shipping, any player with a complete set of cards from a set could redeem that set to have the physical cards shipped to them. This came with the announcement that all digital goods like packs and decks would be priced exactly the same amount as their physical counterparts. Even today, you may hear Magic Online being referred to as the acronym MODO. This is the origin of that acronym, Magic Online with Digital Objects. Vault collections, dual decks, all of these products are available for purchase on Magic Online for the same price as their real-world counterparts. The idea that the costs associated with running Magic Online as well as the necessary profit margins just happen to be 100% identical to the costs of printing paper booster packs, packaging paper booster packs, and then shipping these paper booster packs worldwide is laughable at best. On July of 2002, Magic the Gathering Online launched. With an impressive feature set that rivals even games today, it released with six complete card sets totaling over to 1,500 cards, Rochester and booster drafts, standard and block constructed, multiplayer variants, online trading and collection management, chat functions, rating trackers, and game replay options. The game's interface took many inspirations from Chandelar, now five years old, both utilizing the top-down perspective and layout of buttons. While the game launched with all cards from 7th edition forward, it was promised that in due time, earlier sets would be implemented. While generally popular, like any software, it had its share of bugs. The fact that cards could be redeemable for paper versions meant that dupes and glitches that gain a large supply of cards would have to be dealt with quickly, often resulting in a mass cleansing from the developers without warning, and sometimes catching honest players in their crossfire. Furthermore, Magic's extensive library of mechanics and interactions had some outlier rules cases that could crash or even win the game for those executing these glitches, intentionally or not. Even though these issues would be fixed over time, the always expanding card pool caused many more to take their place. Despite these issues, Magic the Gathering Online was shaping up to be the one and only way to play Magic digitally, but Wizards of the Coast were still willing to license out the IP to other developers. Magic the Gathering Battlegrounds, developed by Secret Level, returned to the real-time strategy concept that earlier titles like Battle Mage and Armageddon tried to tackle. The gameplay consisted of a one-on-one -on -one duel against a player or AI, in which you would collect mana, summon monsters, and fight incoming threats, all in real time. Many iconic magic monsters and spells were implemented in the game, and players could change their decks or loadouts to suit their playstyle or strategy. I'll admit, at first I had trouble getting into it. The quest mode is kind of slow going to begin with. But as you unlock more spells and get into some truly brain-twisting and reflex-testing challenges, it's easy to get hooked. Fans of frantic, real-time strategy should check this one out for sure, but just don't expect the depth and methodical pace of the card game. During the same time as Battlegrounds release, Magic Online V2 was in development. Wizards announced that they are parting ways with Leaping Lizard and moving development of the client in-house, a choice that software developer and popular Magic columnist Rich Stein later said would haunt them. Despite its many bugs and exploits, Magic Online V2 was released in July of 2003. While the launch of this version was on time, it was unfortunately plagued with crashes, bugs, and rules mistakes. In an article titled, Why Haven't We Reverted?, Daniel Myers tries to address the dire situation. Allegedly because of the way V2 was coded and pushed, a revert to V1 was not possible at the time. Two months later, in October of 2003, the game would finally return to a release date on the V2 version. Despite its issues and fractured infrastructure, Wizards continued to maintain the client, release sets, and adhere to its card redemption systems, all the way to 2008 when V2 was shut down once more to prepare for the V3 release. V3, built from the ground up, released on April of 2008. Like its predecessor, for the following year, it would too suffer many server and gameplay issues, to the point of its downtime being nearly equal with its uptime. Again, despite its hiccups, Magic Online was still the only way to play Magic at any time that you wanted. And as the paper game became more popular, the online client did as well. Online's brand manager, Worth Wolpert, was quoted saying that in 2007, Magic Online accounted for 30-50% to 50 of the total Magic business. More events, formats, and features were continually added to the client, alongside new sets of cards that would come out routinely two weeks after their paper release. 
However, slowly over time, Magic Online would eventually work backwards to include all cards ever printed in Magic. As things were added, its general interface remained the same from its first release in 2002. As leaps in computing power and graphical fidelity were being made, due to its complexity, Magic Online could never be updated beyond rule, format, and card editions. It was at the point where Magic Online was just as vast and complex as the paper game. Ironically, it needed its own introductory experience to ease players in. That was visually appealing in the same way many games of the time were. In 2009, this prompted Duels of the Planeswalkers, a Wizards of the Coast developed title for the PC, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360. Returning to the slightly skewed camera angle reminiscent of sitting down at a table, this first entry in what would later become a series was the perfect introduction to the game rules. There was intentionally only mechanically basic cards and decks, and no deck building at all. Only pre-constructed decks that could be slightly altered as you unlocked more options battling through a series of AI opponents. What this game offers in the end is superb gameplay, access to a large community of Magic players, and a great way to teach your friends how to play, all for about 10 bucks. What's that, like two and a half boosters? The only thing I'd like to see hopefully changed in the next update, other than new cards of course, is a full deck editor. If Wizards would just loosen the grip they have with Magic Online, this game could attract an exponentially wider audience. Even though there was nothing there for seasoned veterans of the card game, it wasn't being designed for them. But it did paint a picture of what Magic Online could have looked like if it was developed in a different time. Speaking of games out of time, despite a history of duds, Wizards were still willing to take a chance on non-card-based titles in the franchise. Magic the Gathering Tactics was first announced in 2009 and finally released in 2011 for the PC, coming later to Steam. Sony Online Entertainment's take on the franchise was perhaps more in tune with Magic's theme than its predecessors. Tactics was a one-on-one -on -one turn based strategy game. With a periodically increasing mana pool, you would summon and micromanage the movement of your creatures to defeat the enemy planeswalker. Multiplayer play was available, and similar to the card game, you could buy packs containing units and even trade them between players through an in-game auction house. The near-infinite combinations and permutations of the game's over 300 spells and creatures ensures that no two games will play out the same, and each will test your skill and tactical prowess. The single-player campaign chapters of five missions each are fun, but paying $5 a pop seems a little steep, no matter what spell rewards you might earn. Playing against other players is definitely the focus of Magic Tactics. Finding a pickup match is a simple button-click away, and SOE is always running a tournament or two filled with guys who spent way more money on their spellbooks than you did. Right now, the game is worth the free download to see if the tactical challenge appeals to you, but you can withhold your hard-earned station cast for the game to mature a bit with a few expansions and patches. Tactics had only niche appeal, and because of that and its slightly harsh monetization model, the game never found an audience. Its servers shut down in March of 2014. Meanwhile, the rest of Digital Magic was booming. Duels of the Planeswalkers 2012 released, rehashing and very slightly iterating on its formula with some new cards and visuals. In an executive summary, Worth Wilport talked about the record year that 2012 was, revealing additional information about V4 of the Magic Online client, which was now in beta for two months. This client ran in parallel to the V3 version for two years, before becoming the sole client still used to this day. Well, here's one of the things I think is lost on players at local game stores versus Magic Online. Your level of instruction. I feel that teaching a player how to play Magic at a local game store can be difficult, slow, and as a new player, you feel bad when you miss triggers, activations, and parts of a turn where you could have turned around your match, the stack, upkeep triggers, and beginning of combat triggers. I think these are the hardest thing to grasp as a new player. And sure, practice makes perfect in paper Magic. And sure, the get good argument does stand true. But one thing that I love about MTGO is that priority bar. It tells you exactly where you're at during each of your turns and during your opponent's turns. This teaches you that your lands untap before you draw a card, it teaches you how passing priority works during combat, and so many other things. I truly feel that this alone makes MPGO a purchase for you if you want to be a better player. I am not going to grade Magic Online. Rather, I would like to present you with an equation that I hope catches on. Paper Magic is greater than Magic Online. Always. But Magic Online is greater than no magic, always. If you do not have a local game store near you, nor friends who play magic, then Magic Online is likely worth it to you. Magic Online remains today as the most extensive way to play Magic in its entirety, with all of its cards, formats, and modes. Many avenues exist within to become a professional player, and there are ways to pivot being a successful online player to a paper one. Cards in Magic Online go out of circulation slower than their paper counterparts. This combined with plentiful reprints lets Magic Online be a much cheaper way to play and enjoy these normally expensive paper formats.
Now the counter argument to this is always, quote, well, yeah, but that's paper versus digital. You get an actual physical product when buying the paper version. And yeah, that's true. However, I present to you my counter argument. I live in a town with few local game stores. None of them are doing events until the weekend, so I only get to play Magic on Fridays or Saturdays, and maybe on Sundays when there's a pre-release. I've also walked into stores that were only one format or another thanks to the size of the player pool, so you're either forced to adapt or just not play at all. It's a sad but true reality of local game stores. While trading exists, many third-party services not affiliated or endorsed by Wizards are available for purchasing and selling cards. Because a clause in Magic Online's Terms of Service stipulates that all digital goods are property of Wizards of the Coast, trades are never considered a sale. This lets transactions in Magic Online get around import laws, duties, and underage concerns. The biggest problem with Magic Online was never its gameplay or card balance, as those have gotten progressively better in Magic's 26-year lifespan. If history is anything to go by, you would think it would be its stability, and you would be correct. But its interface is trailing a close second. While information dense and functional, the layout is not particularly intuitive or pleasing to look at. To a Magic Online player, this is a trivial downside in comparison to crashes and economy concerns, but to possible new players, it's a big hurdle to cross with today's standards. This is why Duels of the Planeswalkers got four yearly releases from 2012 to 2015. All of these titles shared the same pretty looking shell and focus on simple mechanics. Slowly over time, their feature set got increased with a more robust campaign and sealed play. From 2013 onwards, the series was available on iPad as well. Once you know your way around an enchantment, you can battle other players online or offline. Set out to solve a series of wizardly puzzles that require smart solutions to overcome complex board setups, or follow the hot-blooded Chandra Nalar through a fairly straightforward quest to vanquish her rivals. By focusing more on the fiction that's built up around the cards, the game knowingly exposes its dorkier side, but the way the campaign is divided into different settings, exploring the flavor and mechanics of various card sets with theme challenges, works extremely well and could give players an idea of what real-life sets they'd want to get into should they ever get into the paper side of the hobby. I'm gonna find him, and he'll pay! Magic is power. It has the capacity to create and destroy, manipulate, and transform. It can shatter the very laws that govern each world. The infinite planes of the multiverse are home to countless mages. Yet for all their mastery over their craft, they are each bound to their own planes of reality. Duels of the Planeswalkers was successful in its aim to bring in new players to the franchise. Seeing this success, and wanting a more definitive answer to the breakout success of Hearthstone, Magic Duels was announced as the final and definitive entry in the series, promising an expanding card pool that would mirror the release of paper sets much like Magic Online, but with the interface and visuals of Duels of the Planeswalkers. Magic Duels was released on July of 2015 with the Magic Origins paper set. With many of the same features and an almost identical look, this was supposed to be the final successor to the Duels franchise, and possibly over time an alternative to Magic Online. The game took many inspirations from the now proven model of Hearthstone, completing daily objectives, playing through the campaign, and participating in the ranked mode granted coins, which could then be redeemed for booster packs. While it was criticized for having a less than generous economy model, over time it developed an audience. Now, collectible card games always contain an element of pay to win, and that's something you should be aware of. There's no getting around that fact. But, when compared with other games in the genre, it's pretty similar and it's very fair in my opinion. However, I can't help but feel that Wizards of the Coast simply don't care about the digital market or simply don't understand it. I have no idea what the budget for this game was or the timelines involved, but it's obvious to me that this game is a shell of what it could have been. Another title that managed to develop a cult following was a mobile-only game titled Magic the Gathering Puzzle Quest. The Puzzle Quest series combined traditional Match 3 gameplay with strategy and RPG elements, so it was a good fit for the Magic franchise. During the game, you would combine combos of mana orbs to produce the game's resource, which you could then spend on playing spells or creatures that will attack automatically at the end of turn. The fast-paced and deep gameplay combined with a surprisingly fair monetization model made this game very popular with the demographic that it was targeting. It has a small but dedicated community and is maintained to this day. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for the Duels franchise. Being maintained for two years after its release, and a day before the rollout of its 8th set, Amonkhet, without any prior warning, Wizards would announce that the next set would be the game's last. In an article, Jeffrey Stiefiel outlined the company's plans moving forward with something called the Magic Digital Next initiative, an umbrella term for the company's shift in how they approach Magic the Gathering video games. This initiative was started by newly appointed CEO Chris Cox, who was brought on the previous year from his position at Microsoft. 
Understandably, the Duel's player base was distraught to hear this news. I'd like to not be salty about this, but seriously guys, just not you're not going to offer any closure whatsoever here. So that means we just got left with half a set. What the hell? Like, they just dropped this out of nowhere, no warning. Magic Duels is no longer going to be updated at all. No more patches, no more nothing. And saying that's all we're giving you oh you dropped a couple hundred bucks on the game well thank you very much but well, we're not gonna give you no more the weight and suddenness of the announcement was certainly startling however many were curious to see what this next chapter of digital magic would hold as it was apparently big enough to kill the duels franchise on september of 2017 we would have our answer Magic the Gathering Arena was announced. Developed completely in-house, this was advertised as the definitive modern way to digitally play the now 24-year-old game. A closed beta lasted a month, before a large-scale one would last a year until September 27, 2018, when an open beta started. The game is expected to have its full launch sometime in 2019. Magic the Gathering Arena's biggest strength is learning from the mistakes and successes of its predecessors. Built from the ground up to handle an ever-expanding card pool like Magic Online, but with the visual clarity and finesse of the Duel series. Many quality of life improvements were done better here than they were ever before. The automatic passing through of phases, quick spell resolving, and automatic mana tapping made each game as fluid and quick as it can be on the tabletop version. Visually, it was also a step up. The slightly drab color scheme that both online and duels shared was replaced with sharper and brighter colors. The cards, now cut in half on the board, much like Chandelar, fit bigger board states better, both saving space and being easier to read. While no trading is available, which is arguably a core part of Magic, it has a system that is more in line with current trends, and after some updates has been generally well received. Over time, more events and sets have been added on the date of their paper releases, and with each new set, Wizards has been loading in a slew of fancy new animations, boards, and recently, cosmetics. While it had its skeptics in the beginning, its recent breakout success has surpassed anything that any Magic video game has done before. Four. To keep the momentum up, three months after Arena's release, Wizards announced that they would be putting $10 million into prizes for Magic Esports in 2019, double from their previous year. Even though Tabletop Magic does take a share of this, it's obvious that it was the success of Arena that prompted it. There's a lot of little things that have been improved uh, playing now versus a month ago. I noticed that the game state, uh, it doesn't feel like the old Magic the Gathering online games where there's a lot of like you know, they're kind of a bit clunky sometimes when you have a lot of triggers and you have specifically a lot of triggers on your opponent's turn that your opponent is interacting with. So much of that is made so smooth in Magic the Gathering Arena that I actually feel we might have the first huge uh, Magic the Gathering game. I think this is a game that most people can really dig into and love because it, it just has that fluidity. It's so much more fluid. A lot of that clunkiness is gone. I've never played such a smooth Magic the Gathering game. And again, I imagine they're going to continually improve things. From constant updates to aggressive marketing to 10 million up for grabs, it's clear to see that Wizards is all in on Arena. Even though it might have come in late in the game, it seems that after 21 years of ups and downs, Digital Magic is finally done right.